Chapter 5. Fakers and Fiestas The Prince of Darkness is a Gentleman. Shakespeare, King Lear It was always during the late spring that my collection of animals swelled to a point where even Mother occasionally grew alarmed, for it was then that everything was arriving and hatching, and baby animals are, after all, easier to acquire than adults. It was also the time when the birds, newly arrived to nest and rear their young, were harried by the local gentry with guns in spite of the fact that it was out of season. Everything was grist to their mill, these towny sportsmen, for whereas the peasants would stick to the so-called game birds, thrushes, blackbirds and the like, the hunters from the town would blast everything that flew. You would see them returning triumphantly, weighed down with guns and bandoliers of cartridges, their game bags full of a sticky, bloody, feathery conglomeration of anything from robins to red starts, from nuthatches to nightingales. So in the spring, my room and that portion of the veranda set aside for the purpose always had at least half a dozen cages and boxes containing gape-mouthed baby birds or birds that I'd managed to rescue from the sportsmen and which were recuperating with makeshift splints on wings or legs. The only good thing about this spring slaughter was that it gave me a pretty good idea of what birds were to be found on the island. Realising I could not stop the killing, I at least turned it to good account. I would track down the brave and noble Nimrods and ask to see the contents of their game bags. I would then make a list of all the dead birds and, by pleading, save the lives of those that had only been wounded. It was by this means that Hiawatha came into my possession. I had spent an interesting and energetic morning with the dogs. We'd been up early and out in the olive groves while everything was still dawn chilly and misted with dew. I'd found this an excellent time for collecting insects, for the coldness made them lethargic and unwilling to fly, and thus more easily acquired. I'd obtained two butterflies and a moth new to my collection, two unknown beetles and seventeen locusts which I collected to feed my baby birds with. By the time the sun was well up in the sky and had gathered some heat, we had unsuccessfully chased a snake and a green lizard, milked Agatha's goat, unbeknownst to her, into a collecting jar as we were all thirsty, and dropped in on my old shepherd friend Yanni, who provided us with some bread and fig cake and a straw hat full of wild strawberries to sustain us. We made our way down to a small bay where the dogs lay panting or crab-hunted in the shallows while I, spread eagled like a bird in the warm transparent water, lay face downwards holding my breath and drifting over the landscape of the sea. When it grew close to midday and my stomach told me lunch would be ready, I dried off in the sun, the salt forming in patches on my skin like a silky pattern of delicate lace, and started off home. As we meandered through the olive groves, shady and cool as a well between the great trunks, I heard a series of explosions in the myrtle groves away to the right. I moved over to investigate, keeping the dogs close to me, for Greek hunters were jumpy and would in most cases shoot before stopping to identify what they were shooting at. The danger applied to me too, so I talked loudly to the dogs as a precaution. Here, Roger, heel. Good boy, puke. Whittle. Whittle, come here. Heel. That's a good boy. Puke, come back. I spotted the hunter sitting on a giant olive root and mopping his brow, and as soon as I knew he had seen us, I approached him. He was a plump, white little man, with a moustache like an elongated black toothbrush over his prim little mouth, and dark glasses covered eyes as round and as liquid as a bird's. He was dressed in the height of fashion for hunting, polished riding boots, new breeches in white cord, an atrociously cut hacking jacket in mustard and green tweed, beset with so many pockets that it looked like the eaves of a house hung with swallows' nests. His green Tyrolean hat, with its bunch of scarlet and orange feathers, was tilted to the back of his curly head, and he was mopping his ivory brow with a large handkerchief that smelled strongly of cheap cologne. Calimela, Calimela, he greeted me, beaming and puffing. Welcome. Whew. It's a hot day, isn't it? I agreed, and offered him some of the strawberries that remained in my hat. He looked at them rather apprehensively, as if they were fearing they were poisoned, took one delicately in his plump fingers, and smiled his thanks as he popped it into his mouth. I got the impression that he had never before eaten strawberries out of a hat with his fingers, and was not quite sure about the rules. 
I've had a good morning's hunt, he said proudly, pointing to where his game bag lay, bulging ominously, blood bespattered and feathery. From the mouth of it protruded the wing and head of a lark, so blasted and mangled that it was difficult to identify. Would he, I inquired, mind if I examined the contents of his bag? No, no, of course not, he said. You will see I am quite a marksman. I did see. His bag consisted of four blackbirds, a golden oriole, two thrushes, eight larks, fourteen sparrows, two robins, a stone chat, and a wren. The last, he admitted, was a bit small but very sweet to eat if cooked with paprika and garlic. But this, he said proudly, is the best. Be careful because it's not quite dead. He handed me a blood-stained handkerchief and I unwrapped it carefully. Inside, gasping and exhausted, a great hard seal of blood on its wing, was a hoopoe. This, of course, is not good to eat, he explained to me, but the feathers would look good in my hat. I had long wanted to possess one of these splendid heraldic-looking birds, with their fine crests and their salmon pink and black bodies, and I'd searched everywhere for their nests so that I could hand-rear some young ones. Now here was a live hoopoe in my hands, or, to be more exact, a half-dead one. I examined it carefully, and found that it, it in fact looked worse than it was, for all it had was a broken wing, and this was a clean break as far as I could judge. The problem was how to get my proud, fat hunter to part with it. Suddenly I had an inspiration. I started by saying that it made me feel bitter and annoyed that my mother was not there at that moment, for she was, I explained, a world-famous authority on birds. Mother could, with difficulty, distinguish between a sparrow and an ostrich. She had, in fact, written the definitive work on birds for the hunters of England. To prove it, I produced from my collecting bag a battered and much consulted copy of A Bird Book for the Pocket by Edmund Sanders, a book I was never without. My fat friend was most impressed. He turned over the pages muttering appreciative po 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 poles to himself. My mother, he said, must be a remarkable woman to have written such a book. The reason I wished she was there at this moment, I went on, was because she had never seen a hoopoe. She had seen every other bird on the island, including the rare kingfisher. To prove it, I took the scalp of a dead kingfisher I had found and used as a talisman in my collecting bag and laid it in front of him. He was struck with this little skull cap of bright blue feathers. They were much prettier than the hoopoe feathers when one considered it, I said. It took a little time for the thought to penetrate, but I soon had him begging that I would take the hoopoe to my mother in exchange for the scrap of the velvety blue feathers. I put on a nice display of astonished reluctance, fading into grovelling gratitude, put the wounded hoopoe inside my shirt, and hurried home with it, leaving my hunter friend sitting on his olive root, looking like a tweedledum, and trying happily to fix the kingfisher scalp to his hat with a pin. When I got home, I took my new acquisition to my room and examined it carefully. To my relief, its long curved rubbery beak like a slender scimitar was intact, for without the use of this delicate organ I knew that the bird could not survive. Apart from exhaustion and fright, the only thing wrong with it appeared to be a broken wing. The break was high in the upper wing and, on investigating it gently, I found that it was a clean break, the bone having been snapped like a dry twig and not smashed and splintered like a green one. I carefully cut away the feathers with my dissecting scissors, washed the scab of blood and feathers away with warm water and disinfectant, splinted the bone with two curved slivers of bamboo, and bound the whole thing up tight. It was quite a professional job, and I was proud of it. The only trouble was that it was too heavy, and when I released the bird it fell over on its side, dragged down by the weight of the splint. After some experiment, I managed to make a much lighter splint out of bamboo and sticking plaster, and with a thin strip of bandage bound the whole thing firmly to the bird's side. Then, with a pipette, I gave it a drink of water, and placed it in a cardboard box covered with a cloth to recover. I called the hoopoe Hiawatha, and the family greeted its arrival in our midst with unqualified approval, for they liked hoopoes, and moreover it was the only exotic bird species they could all recognise at twenty paces. Finding things to eat for Hiawatha kept me very busy during the first few days of her convalescence, for she was a finicky patient, would only eat live food and was choosy about that. 
I had to release her on the floor of my room and throw the titbits at her. The succulent grasshoppers as green as jade, locusts with plump thighs, their wings as crisp as biscuits, small lizards and tiny frogs. These she would grab and bang vigorously on any suitable hard surface, a chair or a bed leg, the edge of the door or table, until she was sure they were dead. Then a couple of quick gulps and she would be ready for the next course. One day, when the family had all assembled in my room to watch Hiawatha feed, I gave her an eight-inch slow worm. With her delicate beak, her finely banded crest, and her beautiful pink and black colour scheme, she looked a very demure bird, even more so because she generally kept her crest folded back against her skull. But now she took one look at the slow worm and changed into a predatory monster. Her crest rose and spread itself, quivering like a peacock's tail. Her throat puffed out. She uttered a strange little purring grunt deep in her throat and hopped rapidly and purposefully towards where the slow worm was dragging along its burnished copper body, oblivious of its fate. Hiawatha paused, and with her splinted and her good wings spread out, she leaned forward and pecked at the slow worm, a rapid rapier thrust of her beak, so quick it was difficult to see. The slow worm at the blow writhed into a lashing figure of eight, and I saw to my amazement that Hiawatha's first blow had completely crushed the reptile's eggshell fragile skull. Good Lord, said Larry, equally amazed. Now that's what I call a useful bird to have around the house. A few dozen of those around, we wouldn't have to worry about snakes. I don't think they could tackle a big one, said Leslie judiciously. Well, I wouldn't mind if they just cleaned up the small ones, said Larry. That'd be a start. You talk as if the house were full of snakes, dear, put in Mother. It is, answered Larry austerely. What about the Medusa wig of snakes Leslie found in the bath? They were only water snakes, said Mother. I don't care what they were. If Jerry's going to be allowed to fill the bath with snakes, then I shall carry a brace of hoopoos around with me. Ooh, look at it now, squeaked Margot. Hiawatha had delivered a number of rapid blows down the length of the slow worm's body, and she was now picking up the still writhing length and dashing it onto the floor rhythmically, as fishermen would beat an octopus against the rocks to make it tender. After a time there was no discernible life left in the body. Hiawatha stared down at it, crest up, head on one side. Satisfied, she seized the head in her beak. Slowly, gulping and throwing her head back, she swallowed it inch by inch. In a couple of minutes, there was only half an inch of tail protruding from the corner of her beak. Hiawatha never grew really tame, and she was always nervous, but she learned to tolerate human beings in fairly close proximity to her. When she'd settled down, I used to take her out onto the veranda where I kept various other birds and let her walk about in the shade of the grapevine. It was not unlike a hospital ward for at that time I had six sparrows recovering from concussion brought about by being caught in breakback mousetraps set by peasant boys, four blackbirds, and a thrush who had been caught by baited fish hooks set in the olive groves, and half a dozen assorted birds ranging from a tern to a magpie recovering from the effects of gunshot wounds. In addition there was a nest of young goldfinches and an almost fledged greenfinch which I was hand rearing. Hiawatha did not seem to mind the proximity of these other birds, but she kept herself to herself, pacing slowly up and down the flagstones, brooding with half-closed eyes, aloofly aristocratic like a beautiful queen imprisoned in some castle. At the sight of a worm, frog or grasshopper, of course, her behaviour would become anything but queenly. About a week after Hiawatha had entered my avian clinic, I set off one morning to meet Spiro. This was a sort of daily ritual. He would blow loud blasts on his horn when he reached the edge of the property, which was some fifty acres in extent, and I and the dogs would tear through the olive groves to intercept him somewhere along the drive. Panting for breath, I would burst out of the olive groves, the dogs barking hysterically in front of me, and we would hold up the great gleaming dodge, its hood back, Spiro in his peaked cap crouching, massive, brown and scowling behind the wheel. I would take my place on the running board, holding tight to the windscreen, and Spiro would drive on, the dogs in an ecstasy of mock fierceness trying to bite the front tyres. The conversation every morning was also a ritual that never varied. "'Good mornings, Master Jerry's,' Spiro would say. "'How's I use?' Having ascertained that I had not developed any dangerous disease during the night, 
he would inquire after the rest of us. "'And how's the families?' he would ask. "'How's your mother's, and Master Larry's, and Master Leslie's, and Missy Margot's?' By the time I had reassured him as to their health, we would have reached the villa, where he would lumber from one member of the family to the other, checking as to whether my information was correct. I was rather bored by the daily, almost journalistic interest Spiro took in the family's health, as if they were royalty, but he persisted as if some awful fate might have overtaken them during the night. One day, in a fit of devilry, I told him, in response to his earnest inquiry, that they were all dead. The car swerved off the drive and crashed straight into a large oleander bush, showering Spiro and myself with pink blossoms and nearly knocking me off the running board. "'Gollies, Master Jerry's! You mustn't say things like that!' he roared, pounding the wheel with his fist. "'You makes me scarce when you say things like that! You makes me sweats! Don't you ever say that again!' This particular morning, having reassured himself as to the health of each member of the family, he lifted a small strawberry basket covered with a fig leaf from the seat by his side. "'Here,' he said, scowling at me, "'I got some presents for you.' I took the leaf off the basket. Inside crouched two naked and repulsive-looking birds. I was enchanted and thanked Spiro profusely, for they were baby jays, as I could see by their sprouting wing feathers. I'd never had jays before. I was so pleased with them that I took them with me when I went to my studies with Mr. Kralewski. This was the advantage of having a tutor who was as mad about birds as I was. Together we spent an exciting and interesting morning trying to teach them to open their mouths and feed, when we should have been committing the glittering pageantry of English history to memory. But the babies were singularly stupid and refused to accept either Kralewski or myself as a substitute mother. I took them back home at lunchtime and during the afternoon tried to get them to behave sensibly, but without success. They would only take food if I forced their beaks open and pushed it down their throats with my finger, a process that they strongly objected to, as well they might. Eventually, having shoved enough down them to keep them more or less alive, I left them in their strawberry basket on the veranda and went to fetch Hiawatha, who had shown a marked preference for having her food served on the veranda, rather than in the privacy of my room. I placed her on the flagstones and started to throw her the grasshoppers I had caught for her. She hopped eagerly, snapped up the first, killed it and swallowed it with almost indecent haste. As she sat there gulping, looking rather like an elderly angular dowager duchess who had swallowed a sorbet the wrong way at a ball, the two baby jays lolling their heads bleary-eyed over the edge of their basket caught sight of her. Immediately they started to call wheezily, open-mouthed, their heads wobbling from side to side like two very old men looking over a fence. Hiawatha put up her crest and stared at them. I did not expect her to take much notice, for she always ignored the other baby birds when they called out to be fed. But she hopped nearer the basket and surveyed the baby jays interestedly. I threw her a grasshopper, and she grabbed it, killed it, and then, to my complete astonishment, hopped up to the basket and crammed the insect down the gaping maw of one of the jays. Both babies wheezed and screamed and flapped their wings in delight, and Hiawatha looked as startled as I was at what she'd done. I threw her another grasshopper and she killed it and fed the other baby. After this, I would feed Hiawatha in my room and then bring her down onto the veranda periodically where she would act the part of mother to the baby jays. She never showed any other maternal feelings for the babies. She would not, for example, seize the little encapsulated blobs of excreta from the babies' behinds when they cocked them over the edge of the nest. This task of cleaning was left up to me. Once she had fed the babies so that they stopped screaming, she lost all interest in them. I concluded it must be something in the timbre of their call that aroused her maternal instincts, for although I experimented with the other babies I possessed and they all screamed their lungs out, she took no notice at all. Gradually the baby jays decided to let me feed them, and as soon as they stopped calling at her appearance, Hiawatha took no further notice of them. It was not simply that she ignored them, she seemed unaware of their existence. When her wing had healed, I removed the splint and found that although the bone had set well, the wing muscles had become weak with lack of use, and Hiawatha tended to favour the wing, always walking rather than flying. To make her exercise it, I used to take her down in the olive groves and throw her up into the air so that she was forced to use her wings to make a safe landing. 
Gradually, she started to take short flights as the wing strengthened, and I began to think that I would be able to release her. When she met her death. I had taken her out on the veranda one day, and while I was feeding my assortment of babies, Hiawatha flew, or rather glided, down to a nearby olive grove to practice her flying and make a light snack on some daddy longlegs that were just hatching. I was absorbed in feeding the babies, and I was not taking much notice when suddenly I heard a hoarse, despairing cry from Hiawatha. I vaulted over the veranda rail and raced through the trees, but I was too late. A large, mangy, battle-scarred, feral cat was standing with the limp form of the hoopoe in its mouth, his great green eyes staring at me over her pink body. I gave a shout and ran forward. The cat turned with oil-like fluidity and leapt into the myrtle bushes, carrying Hiawatha's body with him. I gave chase, but once the cat had reached the tangled sanctuary of the myrtles it was impossible to track him down. I returned, furious and upset, to the olive grove where well, all that was left to remind me of Hiawatha were some pink feathers and a few drops of blood scattered like rubies on the grass. I swore that if I ever came across the cat again, I would kill it if I could. Apart from anything else, it presented a threat to the rest of my bird collection. But my mourning for Hiawatha was cut short by the arrival in our midst of something slightly more exotic than a hoopoe, and much more trouble. Larry had suddenly announced that he was going to stay with some friends of his in Athens and do some research work. After the flurry of his departure, tranquillity descended on the villa. Leslie spent most of his time pottering about with a gun, and Margot, who at that moment was not engaged in any hectic affair of the heart, had taken up soap sculpture. Ensconced in the attic, she was producing somewhat lopsided and slippery pieces of sculpture out of an acrid smelling yellow soap and appearing in a flowered smock and an artistic trance at mealtimes. Mother, seizing on this unexpected period of calm, decided to do a job that had long wanted doing. The previous year had been an exceptionally good one for fruit, and Mother had spent hours preparing various jams and chutneys, some from her grandmother's recipes from India dating back to the early 1800s. Everything went fine, and the big cool larder was aglint with battalions of bottles. Unfortunately, during a particularly savage storm in the winter, the larder roof had leaked, and in consequence, Mother had come down one morning and found all the labels had come off. She was faced with several hundred jars, the contents of which were difficult to identify unless you opened the jar. Now, given a moment's respite by her family, she determined to do this necessary job. Since it involved tasting, I offered to help. Between us, we had got some 150 jars of preserves on the kitchen table, armed ourselves with spoons and new labels, and were just about to start on the mammoth tasting when Spiro arrived. Good afternoons, Mrs. Durrells. Good afternoons, Master Jellies, he rumbled, lumbering into the kitchen like a chestnut brown dinosaur. I's got a telegrams for you, Mrs. Durrells. A telegram, Spiro? Mother quavered. From whom, I wonder? I hope it's not bad news. No, don't you worry, it's not bad news, Mrs. Durrells, he said, handing her the telegram. I got the man in the post office who reads it to me. It's from Master Larry's. Oh dear, said Mother, with foreboding. The telegram said simply, Forgot to tell you, Prince Gigi Boy, arriving 11th short stay, Athens wonderful, love, Larry. Really, Larry is the most annoying creature, Mother exclaimed angrily. What does he go and invite a prince for? He knows we haven't got the right rooms for royalty, and he won't be here to entertain him. What am I supposed to do with a prince? She gazed at us in a distraught fashion, but neither Spiro nor I could give her any intelligent advice. We could not even telegraph Larry and demand his return, for, characteristically, he had gone off and omitted to give us his friend's address. "'The 11th is tomorrow, isn't it? He'll be coming on the boat from Brindisi, I expect. Spiro, would you meet him and bring him out? And would he bring some lamb for lunch? Jerry, go and tell Margot to put some flowers in the spare room and to make sure the dogs haven't put any fleas in there. And tell Leslie he must go down to the village and tell Red Spiro we want some fish.' Oh, really, it's too bad of Larry. I shall give him a piece of my mind when he gets back. I can't be bothered with entertaining princes at my age. Mother bustled angrily and aimlessly around the kitchen, banging saucepans and frying pans about. 
I'll bring you some dahlias for the tables. Do you want any champagne? asked Spiro, who obviously felt that the prince should be treated properly. No. If he thinks I'm paying a pound a bottle for champagne, he's mistaken. He can just drink ouzo and wine like the rest of us, prince or no prince, said Mother firmly, and then added, Well, I suppose you'd better bring a crate. We needn't give him any, and it always comes in useful. Don't you worry, Mrs. Durrells, said Spiro comfortingly. I fixes anything you wants. You wants I gets the king's butler again? The king's butler, an ancient and aristocratic old boy, was dragged out of retirement by Spiro every time we had a big party. No, no, Spiro, we're not going to go to a lot of trouble. After all, he's coming unexpectedly, so he'll just have to take us as he finds us. He'll just have to take pot luck and... and muck in. And if he doesn't like it, well, it's just too bad, said Mother, shelling peas with trembling hands and dropping more on the floor than into the colander. And, Jerry, go and ask Margot if she could run up those new curtains for the dining room. The material's in my bedroom. The old ones don't look the same since Les set fire to them. So the villa was transformed into a hive of activity. The wooden floor of the spare room was scrubbed until it was a pale cream colour, just in case the dogs had put any fleas in there. Margot ran up the new curtains in record time and did flower arrangements everywhere and Leslie cleaned his guns and boat, in case the prince should want to go shooting or yachting. Mother, scarlet with heat, trotted frantically around the kitchen, making scones, cakes, apple turnovers and brandy snaps, stews, pies, jellies and trifles. I was merely told to remove all my animals from the veranda and to keep them under control, to go and have my hair cut, and to make sure I put on a clean shirt. So the following day, all dressed up by Mother's orders, we sat on the veranda, and waited patiently for the prince to be brought out to us by Spiro. "'What's he a prince of?' asked Leslie. "'Well, I don't really know,' said Mother. "'One of those small states the Maharajas have, I expect.' "'It's a very odd name, Gigi boy,' said Margot. "'Are you sure it's real?' "'Of course it's real, dear,' said Mother. "'There are lots of Gigi boys in India. "'It's a very old family name, like, um, like... "'Smith?' suggested Leslie. No, no, not nearly as common as that. No, the Gigi boys go right back in history. There must have been Gigi boys long before my grandparents went to India. His ancestors probably organised the mutiny, suggested Leslie with relish. Let's ask him if his grandfather invented the black hole of Calcutta. Oh yes, let's, said Margot. Do you think he did? What was it? Leslie, dear, you shouldn't say things like that, said Mother. After all, we must forgive and forget. Forgive and forget what? asked Leslie, bewildered, not having followed Mother's train of thought. Everything, said Mother firmly, adding, rather obscurely, I'm sure they meant well. Before Leslie could investigate this further, the car roared up the drive and drew up the veranda with an impressive squeal of brakes. Sitting in the back, dressed in black, and with a beautifully arranged turban as white as a snowdrop bud, sat a slender, diminutive Indian, with enormous glittering almond-shaped eyes that were like pools of liquid agate, fringed with eyelashes as thick as a carpet. He opened the door deftly and leapt out of the car. His smile of welcome was like a lightning flash of white in his brown face. "'Well, well, here we are at last!' he cried excitedly spreading his slender brown hands like butterfly wings and dancing onto the veranda. You must be Mrs. Durrell, of course, such charm, and you are the hunter of the family Leslie, and Margot the beauty of the island, without doubt, and Jerry the savant, the naturalist par excellence. I can't tell you how hot it makes me to meet you all. Uh, oh, well, uh, uh, yes, uh, we're delighted to meet you, your highness, mother began. Gigi Boy uttered a yelp and slapped his forehead. Dash and damnation, he said. My foolish name again. My dear Mrs. Darrell, how can I apologise? Prince is my Christian name. A vim on my mother's part to make our humble family royal, you understand. A mother's love, um. A dream son will aspire to golden heights, huh? No, no, poor woman. We must forgive her, huh? I am plain Prince Gigi Boy, at your service. Oh, said Mother who, having geared herself to cope with royalty, felt somewhat let down. "'Well, what do we call you?' "'My friends, of which I have an inordinate number,' said the new arrival earnestly, "'call me Gigi. 
I do hope that you will call me the same. So Gigi took up residence, and during the short time he was there, created greater havoc and endeared himself more to us than any other guest we had had. With his pedantic English, his earnest, gentle air, he took such a deep and genuine interest in everything and everyone that he was irresistible. For Lugarezzi he had various pots of evil-smelling sticky substances with which to anoint her numerous imaginary aches and pains. With Leslie he would discuss in grave detail the state of hunting in the world and give graphic and probably untrue stories of tiger and wild boar hunts he had been on. For Margot he procured some lengths of cloth and made them into saris and taught her how to wear them. Spiro he would enthrall with tales of the riches and mysteriousness of the East, of bejeweled elephants wrestling with each other and maharajas worth their weight in precious stones. He was proficient with his pencil, and as well as taking a deep and genuine interest in all my pets, completely won me over by doing delicate little sketches of them for me to stick in my natural history diary, a document which was, to my mind, considerably more important than a combination of the Magna Carta, the Book of Kells and the Gutenberg Bible and was treated as such by our discerning guest. But it was mother that Gigi really charmed into submission, for not only did he have endless mouth-watering recipes for her to write down, and a fund of folklore and ghost stories, but his visit enabled mother to talk endlessly about India, where she had been born and bred, and which she considered her real home. In the evening we would sit long over our meal at the big creaking dining table, the clusters of oil lamps in the corners of the great room blooming in pools of primrose yellow light, the drifts of small moths fluttering against them like snow, the dogs lying in the doorway, now their numbers had risen to four they were never allowed into the dining room, would yawn and sigh at our tardiness, but we would be oblivious to them. Outside the ringing cries of the crickets and the crackle of tree frogs would make the velvety night alive. In the lamplight Gigi's eyes would seem to grow bigger and blacker like an owl's, with a strange liquid fire in them. Of course, in your day, Mrs. Darrell, things were very different. You could not intermingle, no, no, strict segregation, wasn't it? But now things are better. First, the Maharajas got their toes in the doors, and nowadays even some of us humbler Indians are allowed to intermingle, and thus accrue some of the advantages of civilization, said Gigi one evening. In my day, said Mother, it was the Eurasians that they felt most strongly about. We wouldn't be allowed even to play with them by my grandmother. Of course we always did. Children are singularly insensitive to the correct civilised behaviour, said Gigi, smiling. Still there were some difficulties at first, you know. Rome, however, was not built in a day. Did you hear about the Babu in my town who was invited to the ball? No, what happened? Well, he saw that after the gentlemen had finished dancing with the ladies, they escorted them back to their chairs, and fanned them with the ladies' fan. So having conducted a sprightly waltz with a European lady of some eminence, he conducted her safely back to her seat, took her fan, and said, Madam, may I make wind in your face? That sounds like the sort of thing Spiro would say, said Leslie. I remember once, said Mother, throwing herself into reminiscence with pleasure, when my husband was chief engineer in Rocky, we had the most terrible cyclone. Larry was only a baby. The house was a long, low one, and I remember we ran from room to room, trying to hold the doors shut against the wind. And as we ran from room to room, the house simply collapsed behind us. We eventually ended up in the butler's pantry, but when we had the house repaired, the Babel contractor sent in a bill which was headed for repairs to chief engineer's backside. India must have been fascinating then, said Gigi, because unlike most Europeans, you were part of the country. Oh yes, said Mother. Even my grandmother was born there. When most people talked of home and meant England, when we said home, we meant India. You must have travelled extensively, said Gigi enviously. I suppose you've seen more of my country than I have. Practically every nook and cranny, said Mother. My husband being a civil engineer, of course, he had to travel. I always used to go with him. If he had to build a bridge or a railway right out in the jungle, I'd go with him and we'd camp. That must have been fun, said Leslie enthusiastically. A primitive life under canvas. Oh, it was. I loved the simple life in camp. I remember the elephants used to go ahead with the marquees, the carpets and the furniture, and then the servants would follow in the ox-carts with the linen and silver. You call that camping? interrupted Leslie incredulously. With marquees? We had only three, 
said Mother defensively. A bedroom, dining room and a drawing room. And they were built with fitted carpets anyway. Well, I don't call that camping, said Leslie. It was, said Mother. It was right out in the jungle. We could hear tigers and all the servants were terrified. Once they killed a cobra under the dining table. And that was before Jerry was born, said Margot. You should write your memoirs, Mrs. Durrell, said Gigi gravely. Oh, no, laughed Mother. I couldn't possibly write. Besides, what would I call it? How about, it took fourteen elephants, suggested Leslie. Or, through the forest on a fitted carpet, suggested Gigi. The trouble with you boys is you never take anything seriously, said Mother severely. Yes, said Margot. I think it was jolly brave of Mother to camp with only three marquees and cobras and things. Camping, snorted Leslie derisively. Well, it was camping, dear. I remember once one of the elephants went astray, and we had no clean sheets for three days. Your father was most annoyed. I never knew anything as big as an elephant could go astray, said Gigi, surprised. Oh, yes, said Leslie. Easily mislaid, elephants. Well, anyway, you wouldn't like it if you were without clean sheets, said Mother with dignity. Of course they wouldn't, put in Margot, and I think it's fun hearing about ancient India, even if they don't. But I do find it most educational. Gigi protested. You're always making fun of Mother, said Mother. I don't see why you should be so superior just because your father invented the black hole or whatever it was. It says much for Gigi that he almost fell under the table laughing, and all the dogs started barking vociferously at his mirth. But probably the most endearing thing about Gigi was his intense enthusiasm for anything he happened to take up, even when it was demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that he could not achieve success in that sphere of activity. When Larry had first met him, he had decided to be one of India's greatest poets. And with the aid of a compatriot who spoke little English, he was my compositor, Gigi explained. He started a magazine called Poetry for the People, or Pottery for the People, or Pottery for the PP People, depending on whether Gigi was supervising his compositor or not. This little magazine was published once a month, with contributions from everyone that Gigi knew, and some of them made strange reading, as we discovered, for Gigi's luggage was full of blurred copies of his magazine which he would hand out to anyone who displayed interest. Perusing them, we discovered such interesting items as The Pottery of Stiffen Splendour, A Critical Evaluation. Gigi's compositor friend apparently believed in printing words as they sounded, or rather, as they sounded to him at that moment. Thus there was a long and eulogistic article by Gigi on Tease Elliot. Pot Supreme. The compositor's novel spelling, combined with the misprints naturally to be found in such a work, made reading it a pleasurable though puzzling occupation. Why not a black pot laureate? For example, posed an almost unanswerable question, written apparently in Chaucerian English, while the article entitled Roy Campbell, Ball Fighter and Pot, made one wonder what poetry was coming to. However, Gigi was undaunted by the difficulties, including the fact that his compositor never pronounced the letter H and so never used it. His latest enthusiasm was to start a second magazine, printed on the same hand press with the same carefree compositor, devoted to his newly evolved study of what he called Facio, which was described in the first copy of Facio for All as an amalgam of the mysterious East bringing together the best of yoga and fakirism giving details and teaching people ow. Mother was greatly intrigued by Facio, until Gigi started to practice it. Clad in a loincloth and covered in ashes, he meditated for hours on the veranda, or else walked in a well-simulated trance through the house, leaving a trail of ashes behind him. He fasted religiously for days, and on the fifth day worried Mother to death by fainting and falling down the stairs. Really, Gigi? said Mother crossly. This has got to stop. There's not enough of you to fast. Putting him to bed, Mother concocted huge strength-giving curries, only to have Gigi complain that there was no Bombay duck, the dried fish which was such a pungent and attractive addition to any curry. Oh, but you can't get it here, Gigi. I've tried, Mother protested. Gigi waved his hands like pale bronze moths against the white of the sheet. Fakio tells that in life there is a substitute for everything he said firmly. When he recovered sufficiently, he paid a visit to the fish market in the town and purchased a vast quantity of fresh sardines. 
we came back from a pleasant morning shopping in the town to find the kitchen and its environs untenable. Gigi brandishing a knife with which he was gutting the fish before laying them out in the sun to dry outside the back door, was doing battle with what appeared to be every fly, blue bottle, and wasp in the Ionian Islands. He'd been stung about five times, and one eye was swollen and partially closed. The smell of rapidly decomposing sardines was overwhelming, and the kitchen floor and table were covered in snowdrifts of silver fish skin and bits of entrails. It was only when Mother showed him the article on Bombay Duck in the Encyclopaedia Britannica that he reluctantly gave up the idea of sardines as a substitute. It took Mother two days, with buckets of hot water and disinfectant, to rid the kitchen of the smell, and even then there was still the odd wasp blundering in, hopefully, through the windows. "'Perhaps I'd better find you a substitute in Athens or Istanbul,' said Gigi hopefully. "'I was thinking that lobster baked and crushed to a powder.' "'I wouldn't worry about it, Gigi dear,' said Mother hurriedly. "'We've done without it for some time now, and it hasn't hurt us.' Gigi was en route for Persia via Turkey in order to visit an Indian fakir practising there. "'From him I shall learn many things to add to Fakir,' said Gigi. "'He is a great man. In particular, he is a great exponent of holding his breath and going into a trance. He was once buried for a hundred and twenty days.' "'Extraordinary,' said Mother, deeply interested. "'You mean buried alive?' asked Margot. Buried alive for a hundred and twenty days? How horrible! It doesn't seem natural somehow. But he's in a trance, dear Margot. He feels nothing, explained Gigi. I'm not so sure, said Mother musingly. That's why I want to be cremated, you know, just in case I happen to slip into a trance and no one notices. Don't be ridiculous, Mother, said Leslie. It's not ridiculous, replied Mother firmly. People are so careless nowadays. And what else does a fake here do? asked Margot. Can he make mango trees grow from seeds? You know, straight away. I saw them do that in Simla once. That is simply conjuring, said Gigi. What Androwati does is much more complex. He is an expert in levitation, for example, and it is one of the things I want to see him about. But I thought levitation was card tricks, said Margot. No, said Leslie. It's floating about, sort of flying, isn't it, Gigi? Yes, said Gigi. A wonderful ability. A lot of the early Christian saints could do it. I myself have not yet reached that stage of proficiency. That is why I want to study under Androwati. How lovely to be able to float like a bird, said Margot delightedly. What fun you could have. I believe it to be a truly tremendous experience, said Gigi, his eyes shining. You feel as if you are being lifted towards heaven. The following day, just before lunch, Margot came running into the drawing room in a state of panic. Come quickly, come quickly, she screamed. Gigi is committing suicide. We hurried outside and there, perched on the window sill of his room, was Gigi, clad in nothing but a loincloth. He's got one of those trances again, said Margot, as if it were as an infectious disease. Mother straightened her glasses and stared upwards. Gigi started to sway gently. "'Go upstairs and grab him, Les,' said Mother. "'Quickly, I'll keep him talking.' The fact that Gigi was raptly silent did not occur to her. Leslie rushed into the house. Mother cleared her throat. "'Gigi, dear,' she fluted, "'I don't think it's very wise of you to be up there. "'Why don't you come down and have lunch?' Gigi did come down, but not quite as Mother intended. He stepped gaily out into space and, accompanied by horrified cries from Mother and Margot, fell earthwards. He crashed into the grapevine some ten feet below his window, sending a shower of grapes onto the flagstones. Fortunately the vine was an old and sinewy one and it held Gigi's slight weight. "'My God!' he shouted. "'Where am I?' "'In the grapevine!' screamed Margot excitedly. "'You agitated yourself there!' "'Don't move till we get a ladder,' said Mother faintly. We got a ladder and extricated the tousled Gigi from the depths of the vine. He was bruised and scratched, but otherwise unhurt. Everyone's nerves were soothed with brandy, and we sat down to a late lunch. By the time evening came, Gigi had convinced himself that he had, in fact, succeeded in levitating himself. "'If my toes had not become entangled in the pernicious vine, I would have gone sailing around the house.' he said, lying bandaged but happy on the sofa. 
What an achievement! Yes, well, I'll be happier if you don't practice while you are staying here, said Mother. My nerves won't stand it. I will come back from Persia and spend my birthday with you, my dear Mrs. Durrell, said Gigi, and I will then report progress. Well, I don't want a repetition of today, said Mother severely. You might have killed yourself. Two days later, Gigi Boy, still covered with sticking plaster but undaunted, left for Persia. I wonder if he will come back for his birthday, said Margot. If he does, let's have a special party for him. Yes, that's a good idea, said Mother. He's such a sweet boy, but so erratic, so unsafe. Well, he's the only guest we've had who could really be described as having paid a flying visit, said Leslie.